Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Kukarad from the nursing department here at Nassau Community College. And today we're talking about how one local hospital um, has handled COVID pandemic and to learn about a new trauma program they have started that could save a life. Um, And we're welcoming Dr. Dandrea Joseph, Chief of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery from the NYU Langone Winthrop in Mineola. Dr. Joseph, welcome to Your Family's Health and the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. So, Dr. Joseph, first of all, tell us how you're doing personally during this COVID pandemic and how has it affected you? Uh, Yes, uh, thank you for asking. Like every one of us American citizens, actually worldwide citizens, uh, this has affected us either directly or indirectly. Uh, And um, I have been unfortunately affected in, in both ways. Uh, the obviously this has changed the way that we uh, uh, practice in surgery. Uh, we are thankfully in New York State uh, dwindling, if you would, of, uh, in terms of uh, COVID admissions, and we've gone down significantly in the number of patients that we have in the hospital for COVID positive. Uh, unfortunately, my husband uh, lost a cousin. Uh, to the disease, and I, I lost a colleague who I'd worked with at a previous institution uh, several years ago. So that was it personally uh, for me. So it's definitely been hard, and um, what you don't see is the tremendous strain and stress and stress that is endured by uh, myself, my colleagues, uh, whether they are nursing staff. Uh, residents, uh, PAs, uh, uh, or other essential workers in the hospital, like security. This has taken a tremendous toll on us uh, emotionally. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry to hear that, um, that you were affected in that way. Um, tell me how NYU Langone Winthrop and where, you, where are you uh, with the institution facility hospital? Where are you guys in terms of the COVID pandemic? Have the numbers increased or decreased um, currently? So uh, currently the numbers have decreased. So what I want to say, so the NYU Lango and Enterprise, uh, presently uh, the three main hospital, major hospitals are the uh, Tisch in in the city, as well as uh, NYU Lango in Brooklyn. I'm at NYU Winthrop in Long Island. We are an approved 597-bed facility. And at the start of the pandemic, the governor mandated that every hospital increase the capacity by 50%, which we were able to do. Uh, At one point, uh, we were 96% of uh, patients admitted to the hospital were COVID positive. Today, I can tell you we are down to 3%. That's 96 to down to 3%. Uh, We've also seen that the uh, number of people who are coming into the hospital uh, for, they're coming in for other reasons other than COVID, and they may or may not incidentally test positive for COVID, but we're not seeing the really sick patients who require uh, intubation being put into the ICU. We're not seeing that so right. much anymore. And I, and I apologize for my voice. Last week we had to cancel because I lost my voice completely. And it's oh. kind of back, but it's going in and out. So my apologies if I sound in oh. and out. No problem. Now you are the trauma medical director. What is the definition of trauma in the hospital? Can you talk to how you I'm define so, that? I'm so glad you asked. So my title is actually Chief of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery. 
In that role, I serve as the trauma medical director and also the director of the surgical ICU. Uh, so the medical director, uh, we are surgeons. We are boarded in uh, general surgery and critical care and trauma surgery. Uh, so we're double boarded. And our role is to take care of anyone who presents critically ill, whether it be critically ill from injury or critically ill from uh, a surgical issue. So to that end, uh, as director, I serve as the head, if you would, of the division. So we're a division which is a, a of surgery of the Department of Surgery, and I serve as the head of that division. And I do all things trauma. And um, I think that's what your question was. Uh, yes. one, one of the pet peeves is that uh, trauma surgeons often feel <laughs> that we get asked, oh, so are you in the emergency department? No, we're, you know, with, uh, we're not emergency uh, medicine doctors who are fantastic in their own right. We're specifically uh, 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 geared towards trauma and emergent surgical issues. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Tell me, what is the difference between an ER doctor and a trauma surgeon? Because so I know ER, that so an ER, yeah, an ER doctor is a medicine doctor, mm -hmm. uh, and they are trained in. I'm not sure how their long their residency is. I think it's three years, uh, and they're boarded in ER, and they may do subspecialty or not. The trauma surgeon is a surgeon, not a medical doctor. We're surgeons. Uh, we train for five years in surgical residency, take those boards, and then train an additional two years in the subspecialty of trauma and acute care surgery. And we get boarded in uh, surgical critical care. So with the, as being a trauma surgeon um, now during this pandemic, has your um, surgeries increased or decreased, or how has this um, altered uh, your role in any way during this pandemic? And that's a great question. We actually, um, there's several things that have occurred, and this is actually across the country. And NYU Winthrop is, uh, you know, basically reflects what's going on. So the numbers of trauma patients overall decreased, and they did so significantly in uh, April and May. Mm -hmm. uh, as compared to the prior year. However, what we found was the number of penetrating traumas increased. Mm -hmm. And the incidence of uh, intimate partner violence increased. And uh, those numbers are seen across the country and are reflective of uh, high stress situations. Uh, with respect to surgery, what we found specifically was the numbers with regards to, with respect to our trauma surgical patients did not change very much, but the uh, emergency general surgery cases uh, where we're talking about things like appendicitis, uh, bowel obstructions, things of that nature, that went down a little bit, resulting actually in patients coming at a later time and coming in much sicker than they would normally. Mm -hmm. It was a fear of patients coming into the hospital. So they presented rather late and presented much more sickly than they would have in the non-pandemic era. <clears throat> so tell me how did the COVID pandemic um, increase? I mean, during surgery, we talked about surgery itself decreasing, but what was... Um, the effects of those patients who are undergoing surgery, did that increase the risk for infection um, because of the prevalence of the, of the COVID virus? And that's during surgery. Yes. So I have been doing this, you know, uh, for a fairly long time, you know, being a physician. Uh, I, I graduated from medical school in 1997 and residency and fellowship in 2003 and I have learned to not use the word never, but I feel pretty comfortable saying that the likelihood of getting infected from COVID in the hospital during surgery is zero. 
Uh, I, you know, there are extreme methods that are put into place to ensure the safety of the patient, which include screening of staff, screening of the patient before they present, screening before they go through the operating room. Uh, There are uh, procedures that are put into place where there is an area where there are patients who are tested negative for Mm -hmm. the disease and there are patients who are tested positive or we're not quite sure and they're in a separate part of the hospital. So Mm -hmm. we take extreme measures, the cleaning, which is routine anyway, in the surgery that occurs uh, the scrubbing in and out. There's so many things that I put into place. I'm pretty comfortable saying that you coming into surgery and getting COVID while you're in surgery is never going to happen. Mm, that's great to hear. So, um, so when you're talking about uh, the screening that goes on for patients who are anticipating surgery, that includes what? That's the nasopharyngeal swab. That's is the that- nasal. Yes, that's a that's a, a history taking. Mm-hmm. That's a, a recording of symptoms of the patient. Okay. Then a nasopharyngeal swab is required seventy two hours before the case. So mm-hmm. if you do it at ninety six hours, you're, you're going to need to be tested again. It has to be seventy two hours. Mm-hmm. And then when you come into the hospital, you're still asked again questions about travel. Your temperature is taken. You're asked about symptoms before you actually proceed. Then you go to what we describe as a clean area in the hospital because you're deemed to be COVID negative. So you, you're clean, you know, and I'm not saying that the hospital is not clean. Please do not, um, uh, I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying that you would be in an operating room that has never had any COVID patients, that does not have COVID patients, uh, that the staff, and we also, as I said, the surgeon has also been screened, uh, does not have COVID uh, uh, And so all these things are put into place. So that's the screening that takes place. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of Nancy Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Kukrod, and today we're learning about trauma in the hospital and a great new program called Stop the Bleed with Dr. Joseph, the trauma medical director of NYU Langone Winthrop in Mineola. So Dr. Joseph, um, I'm hearing of this great new program called Stop the Bleed. What is that all about? So I'm glad, you know, I had the opportunity to talk about this because I feel um, uh, a particular, um, you know, affection for Stop the Bleed because I was there at the inception. Uh, The, um, so one of my mentors, Dr. Jacob uh, at, uh, um, uh, Dr. Lenworth Jacobs at uh, Hartford uh, University of Connecticut, uh, where I worked uh, until 2011. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, after the Sandy Hook shooting, uh, he was very moved by the whole event, as we all were. And there were events that occurred where, there, he, rec- where he recognized an opportunity to approach these scenarios. And I have to say scenarios because we know that this happens fairly um, uncommonly in our society. And he realized that there was an opportunity to do things different where patients could potentially be saved. And so he came up with this idea, literally just sitting there and saying, Mm -hmm. we can do this and called it like stop the bleed. And then, Mm -hmm. then thus ensued a whole series of events, et cetera, et cetera. And this was approved by the uh, department of defense. And it is, he's now handed it off. It is, um, the, the, the course is taught by the college. But I remember in particular, um, Dr. Uh, Jacob saying he wanted to make this like CPR so that in the event, in the unfortunate event that there is a, a, a shooting or a, a fall or any kind of injury, that people can recognize that they have the power to potentially save a life or a limb. So what it is simply is the ability to it, it, to stop the bleed. So uh, this is a course that is taught to anyone uh, where we teach the learners how to apply pressure if it's a wound that is um, in a place that is not amenable to tying a tourniquet. And then with an extremity, 
We put a tourniquet on these uh, uh, areas, thereby uh, preventing exsanguination or hemorrhaging of that patient to, until they can get to an area where they can be safely treated. And so uh, that this has been, this was one of Dr. Jacobs' many innovative ideas. And um, because I was at the inception, I feel a particular affinity to this whole thing. So we have taught uh, at this juncture uh, over 1,500 uh, 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 people oh, uh, in, in the area. Um, we're one of several hospitals that, that, that do this, of course, and we continue to teach. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, we cannot go out in public and um, physically make contact with people, which is one of the things that's required. So we've had to put that on hold for now, but we're currently reviewing a, a, a process where we can actually do this through a Zoom or uh, some sort of web, uh, web uh, platform. Mm-hmm. What would be some safety tips uh, that you can provide listeners um, with if they were to injure themselves um, at the point of bleeding or descending, you know, bleeding out or hemorrhaging? Okay. Um, what would you provide uh, as tips for them? I know that everybody does not have the tourniquet, mm-hmm. uh, or if they did have a tourniquet, how do they apply it? So that's where the course comes in, and it's important because applying the tourniquet, we, we did a study with um, uh, that was published in the, um, I forget which uh, journal, but it was a study that looked at uh, first responders and um, uh, security guards and police officers. And, and although they had been exposed to application of the tourniquet, what we found is when we taught the course, the course and we showed how to apply this properly, that it actually, the time to apply it actually improved, suggesting that there's a particular way to apply the tourniquet. Uh, if you find a tourniquet online, and um, I, I, I want to be careful with commercial uh, names here, but we, we use a particular tourniquet. That's the only one that we support. And um, you, you, you apply this with the instructions as best as you can. Uh, you basically put it over the limb and you tighten it and then you kind of turn the swivel down to lock it into place and you put the time on it. The time is really important because you really don't want to keep a tourniquet on a limb for more than 90 minutes. It needs to be applied proximal to the injury. So say your injury is at your forearm, you have a huge bleeding at your forearm, you want to go about the elbow. Say, okay. it, is, um, say it is at your, your thigh, you want to go just below the hip. You know, okay. so it has to be proximal to the injury. Okay. Uh, the second thing is that the tourniquet cannot be applied to certain places. It cannot be applied on your neck. It cannot be applied on the head. It cannot be applied on the torso. So should there be an injury in that area, the other part of the stop the bleed is to apply some, to get some uh, dressing and, uh, uh, and basically stuff that hole to stop the bleed. Now you're asking yourself, where do I get a tourniquet? Where do I get the stuff, the, the dressing? Well, if you have to improvise, you improvise. It may simply be taking your shirt off or your clothing off or, or your belt mm-hmm. and applying it and using that as a tourniquet. It may be taking any piece of clothing you have and stuffing the wound. And obviously that's not going to be sterile, but the idea is stop the bleed, get them to where they need to be, and then we will take care of the aftermath. Because the most important thing that's going to be the demise of this patient, of this person, is the bleeding. Yes. So at what point should I call 911? Should it be as soon as it by, happens? By the tourniquet or after? Nope. You know, what is... You call 911 immediately, immediately. and you okay. apply the tourniquet. Okay. And, are, and how often do you see um, in the community a person um, applying a tourniquet and versus someone not applying the tourniquet in terms of their mortality rate. Um, is, it, is it obvious that those that um, 911 is responding quick enough that, you know, tourniquet, if it's not used, that they will survive it? Or are we seeing the, the increased need for tourniquet use because of trauma in the community? So that is an excellent question. And I'm going to tell you that it's one that I actually cannot answer with respect to the community. And I'll tell you what I mean, right? 
Uh, there are a couple of issues at, at hand here. One of them is that um, where we are in Nassau County, we do not see the gun and knife club the way that I have in other institutions where I've previously worked. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, the, uh, because we are in a vicinity where there are so many trauma centers, patients usually present rapidly and they have been um, addressed either by, uh, most likely by the EMS person, or they get here so quickly that it's um, not necessary with regards to the, uh, uh, what do you call that? With regard to the actually individual themselves or their uh, bystander applying uh, the uh, tourniquet. However, we do have historical information. Uh, in, the, in the war in Afghanistan and the Iraq conflicts, uh, the tourniquets have actually been shown to have a 90% survival rate amongst those with extremity injuries. Wow, that's great. And the patients who do not have uh, the tourniquet applied, there's only a 10% survival rate. So you have 90% with the tourniquet with extremity injuries from the war, and this is published, this is from Craig and, and, and company, and you have a 10% with extremity injuries for those who do not use the tourniquet. So we have historical data. But with respect specifically to this institution, uh, this area, I do not have specific numbers. Oh, that's great. So now um, the course that you talked about in Stop the Bleed, is it a course or is it um, uh, someone comes to your residence to teach you? Is it you go into the communities, the churches to teach this course? Or do you have to come to the hospital to learn about Stop the Bleed? We do both. We go to institutions, we've gone to schools, we've gone to um, uh, any other areas. Uh, We've done high schools a lot. We've done community centers. We've done the library. And we also, prior to the pandemic, used to have a course once a month at our institution. Uh, Mm -hmm. Of course, again, all those things have been put on hold. And and it is a course. uh, There's a lecture that's given that usually lasts about... 30 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on the question and answer session. And then we actually do a practical session where each person is um, taken through application of the tourniquet, as well as application of uh, pressure dressings. And, um, uh, you know, and, and then we allow for, again, question and answer session and for any feedback. So if one of our our friends listening wanted to get in touch with you for more information about this um, Stop the Bleed program, what is, is there a website that we we can refer them to? Yes, the Stop the Bleed website, actually, we list our courses on there, um, but we also have um, uh, in-house a number that you can call, uh, you can call the uh, 516-663-8702. And that will uh, direct you to our Stop the Bleed answer line. And and those courses are directed, managed by our injury prevention nurse, who's also responsible for outreach. And um, yeah, that's how you would uh, do that. And just to end, is is there any uh, remarkable recoveries that that you have been involved with, with uh, with this Stop the Bleed, any good stories you want to tell, short stories that you want to tell us about? Any- oh, there's, there's several. <laughs> um, uh, the one that comes to mind immediately is a gentleman uh, actually at this institution who was uh, run over by a car and who had the tourniquet supplied bilateral low extremities uh, by uh, the, um, the, uh, the EMT staff. And uh, he basically came in with what we describe as mangled extremities. So he lost his extremities, but he did not lose his life because he would have bled out continuously had the tourniquets not been applied. Um, we've had, um, you know, uh, you know, the gunshot wounds, um, not so much. I haven't seen any pressure dressings. Primarily, I've just seen the tourniquets. But uh, I've seen a few of these. But this one is one that uh, comes to mind in particular. Oh, we just recently had a mangled extremity um, mm-hmm. also who came in with a, a tourniquet in place. So Dr. Joseph, you're chief of trauma and acute care surgery. What are your plans in the future? 
to be chair, duh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the way it works, right? You have the chair of the department. Actually, it, it works a little bit. You have the dean of the medical school. Then you have the chair of the department. Then you have the chief of the division. And then you have like the uh, different staff and, um, you know, so, so those, are the t- those are the managerial positions, I guess. Uh, so my goal is to be chair somewhere, not necessarily here, um, because I happen to actually love my chair. And, um, the, uh, and then that's, that's the one part of it. The other part of it is the professorship. Right, so I'm an associate professor of tra- of, of surgery. So my t- my my uh, scholarly title is associate professor of surgery, and the goal is to be a full professor. So you start off with a clinical instructor, assistant uh, assistant professor, uh, associate professor, and then full professor. Does that help? That helps. That sounds good. Yeah. So that means I need to come over for dinner just to see. Who uh- <laughs> Well, I just want to say thank you for being here, Dr. Joseph, the Trauma Medical Director of NYU Langone, Winthrop, and Mineola. Thank you for all the great work you're doing and just this this course and um, program, Stop the Bleeding. And I think this is going to add uh, a wealth of knowledge to us so that we can, in the case of trauma, save a life. So hope that you stay safe and continue to do great work for Long Island and its surrounding communities. This is Dr. Janine Cookerod from the nursing department here at NASA Community College. And I want to thank you for listening to this week's edition of Your Family's Health. We'd like to get your feedback on your family's health. Send your comments by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu. Podcasts of today's show are available on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. This program was produced at the studios of Nassau Community College in cooperation with the nursing department. Join us next week for another edition of Your Family's Health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. No word in the English language is less convincing than probably. Are you sure we should get matching tattoos on our first date? Sure. Um, We'll probably stay together. Probably? (laughs) It's been 23 minutes since I ate. I can probably swim. Uh, you should wait 30 minutes. Mm, okay, now tell me what to do. Cannonball! Cramp! Oh, I have a cramp. I can probably hit the green from here. Probably. Can I get a mulligan? Ready to go? Hey, are you sure you're okay to drive? Yeah, I'm pretty sober. Yeah, I'm probably okay. Probably okay isn't okay, especially when it comes to drinking and driving. If you're drinking, call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council.